growing up, my family wasn't in business. Um, I knew nothing about business, right? I mean, the only thing I've learned about business has been through trial and error and through mentors that I've had along the way. Um, so I've made a boatload of mistakes and I'm very open about that with my team, you know, that made my first million dollars in this industry in 35 months. I pissed away all of it. It's gone, right? Like I have nothing to show for that first million because I didn't know what I was doing. That top line number looks super sexy, but they don't want folks to know what their actual take home is. And that's not a fun place to be. Being open and transparent about that with our agents, you can generate tremendous top line numbers in this business. But if you're not using that to create wealth, that's a personal decision you can make, but it seems like a foolish one. So why don't you start setting yourself up little by little by little to do that? You don't need to go out and buy a portfolio of 75 doors today. But if you take, you know, 10% of your commission check this time and the next check and the next check, like, look, this is how you get to a portfolio of 75 doors or whatever that number that's going to be. You make that a, an actionable item today rather than just some big picture dream, right? You're listening to the number one. Uh, I'm going to start that again. I was really, I was really expecting. The, so just so you're aware, Alex, Vikram, every once in a while, will just like, oh, I say every once in a while, like all the time, interrupt me during the intro. So I was, I was, I was really counting on the interruption there. What, what's, what's the thing? I, I the Pavla's dog. I, I got you with the bell, bro. You were, they did for a lot. We're salivating. You're listening to the number one real estate podcast in the world, where we talk with real estate professionals about their wins, losses, lessons, stories, help you win in your local market today. My name's Cody from Sheridan Street. I'm joined with Vikram Deal of the Real Estate Sales Academy. Vikram Deal, what is happening, my friend? Uh, what's good news in life and business? Are you, uh, what's your plan for the weekend? Like, we're, This is the last podcast on a Friday afternoon, and I'm really curious to know what your evening uh, date plans are. Here, here's what I can say to the last podcast on the Friday. <laughs> uh, I think we're going to go try to go bowling tonight. I think we're going to cool. dinner. I got a little date, and I think we're going to go. Uh, I think you're joining us, Third Wheel. Mm. Uh, everybody yeah. needs a Third Wheel with, with the name of Cody. And we are going to try to go to dinner, bowling, and then be in bed by 10 and tomorrow I am going to try to accomplish one of the hardest bike rides uh in the history of my legs in the morning and uh that's that's what I got going on and then after that I will probably take a nap in the hyperbaric chamber for an hour and then take a shower and meet you at a coffee shop to do some work that sounds like my afternoon my afternoon is definitely <laughs> a coffee shop going to be a work I have a lot of uh a lot of things that I want to accomplish this weekend, but uh, man, like we uh, we have a really awesome guest today. Somebody that I've yeah. uh, got the opportunity to know over the last uh, you know couple months, and uh, has recently uh, moved to Real Brokers, uh, and uh, is a guy that is super driven, super passionate, all over social media, doing a ton of really cool things, helping helping real estate agents really understand how to get their footing in the space, like running a ton of webinars for real estate agents, just teaching them the, uh, the uh, you did it one most recently around sales and objections, or maybe it's coming up, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have Alex Brackey out of the Virginia area uh, with us today. Alex, uh, why don't you give us a high level overview and kind of like who you are, how long you've been in real estate, kind of like what, spawned the genesis of you deciding to take on this massive uh, feat around building a real estate team out of the Virginia area. What's up, gang? I appreciate you all having me. Uh, super excited to be on the podcast. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I've been in real estate. This is, uh, I think, my 10th year now. I was um, uh, Before this, I was, uh, I was in law enforcement for about 10 years. Um, so got into real estate after kind of realizing that's... Um, you know, I, I could be a cop and, and I love being a cop. Don't get me wrong. I loved every second of it, but uh, it started to drag on me when I, when I could see year after year, I was, you know, outperforming the next closest guy to me, you know, like three to one. Uh, and all I got was a plaque on the wall each year, you know, for, for, you know, cop of the year. And, and uh, I decided that I, I wanted to hopefully go into a profession where if I'm going to be the best at what I do, I, I get some sort of financial incentive for it. Right. It's, you know, the, there's some, some financial payoff for that. So, uh, decided to try my hand at real estate uh, and yeah, kind of really haven't looked back. I, I, I got licensed in 2013 
um, started coaching, you know, in, in, with uh, professional coaches in 2014, uh, and really were just with the idea that I just want to be. I didn't have any any specific target in mind. I just wanted to do the best damn job I could, you know, uh, and, and work my face off. Like that's why I just like I like to work. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I've never done less than about 10 million in volume personally. I, I do pretty routinely now 25, 30 million myself, uh, not including the team. Um, well, we do have uh, a, a small team right now, a total of about 11 people, including sales agents, uh, admin staff, marketers, ISA, et cetera. Uh, and so, you know, we, we've got our, our little team that hums along. Uh, last year, we, we did about 50 million in volume. And um, most of it is all here in Northern Virginia. Um, love what we do. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's kind of the, that's the that's the 30,000 foot view. Nice. I, you know, I, I, I we were talking in the, the green room earlier about a couple of things with you. And uh, I'm excited to jump in. I know you you said you you'd recently moved over to real and Cody and I were were jamming about um I, I guess we've never talked about this on the podcast but we, you, you were we were talking about how agents jump ship a lot and I I when I had my team I had agents that would come to me for a few weeks and then few or a few months you felt like a few weeks but they'd be there for a few months and like, oh this doesn't work and then they'd go somewhere else oh this doesn't work then they go somewhere else oh this doesn't work it's never them that doesn't work it's always that but they hop from brokerage to brokerage and you're like you know this was a big a big move for you which it is a big move uh, i i guess i'm curious to know um why do you think agents jump ship so frequently and uh yeah yeah i think i mean i think you you alluded to it. i think you hit the nail on the head right i, I think human behavior is such that we tend to uh when, when there's a problem or th things aren't going right we tend to you have the knee-jerk reaction to look outward instead of looking inward, right? And and I think you know agents, what I call brokerage hopping, right? I mean it's it's no different, right? If if they're not getting the results that they see or you know that they have envisioned for themselves, instead of looking inward and saying what is it about me that I should change, they look out and say what is it about them that needs to change? Uh, and and I think that's a lot of it is. Um, I think you can, I mean, look, you, you, I'm a big believer that you are the average of the, the people you surround yourself with. So it's not that, uh, you know, that, that your surroundings don't matter. They definitely do. But I think, especially starting out, right. The, 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 the bigger, uh, the bigger way to move the needle is, is looking inward and finding out what do I need to improve about my own, my own business, my own habits, right. My, my own strategy, before you start doing smaller tweaks, like who am I surrounding myself with? Right. There's a level of energy that I think that me and Vicker were having a conversation about this. I, I was chatting with Sharon about this. There's a level of energy that is that allows you to kind of shift to a different perspective. And I think a lot of it comes down to your ability to figure things out, your your confidence and your ability to figure things out. I'm curious to know in the beginning when you were trying to get your footing in the space. How did you find that initial broker that didn't make you want to leave another broker? Or was there, was there ever like, as you said, you started in 2013, you just recently moved to real so that, you know, you're putting spent pretty much a decade with a broker. Were there moments where you wanted to leave that brokerage to go somewhere else? It kind of like what, I guess, kept you, kept you there, number one. And number two, how can real estate agents that might have a hard time looking inward and, and and saying maybe it's me like how do they even come to that conclusion like how did you come to that conclusion so so for me so it's it's um it's not 100 percent true right so like i started when i started in real estate i joined a team um now i i had some idea as to what i was looking for i mean at the time i got into real estate i had bought a house sold it and bought another one i used three different real estate agents th three different real estate agents through those processes um, and, and I didn't have any horror stories, but I kept feeling like, man, I, I just feel like this could be done better, right? Um, I was much, obviously much younger uh, at the time. Uh, and, you know, the folks, the agents I was working with um, were, they just weren't communicating with me on a level that seemed to make sense, right? They, the value proposition they were trying to give me was not the one I was looking to have, you know, solved, right? The problem, the problem they were solving wasn't the one I needed solved. Uh, and so, I started going out and looking, and I was trying to find somebody that, uh, you know, I, I was looking for a broker at the time that, you know, was kind of, you know, maybe a little younger, a little techier, right? Was doing the business in a way. I was looking for a mentor, 
right? I, I, I wanted somebody who was doing the business in the same vision that I wanted to do it. Uh, and I, I linked up with uh, one of the big big brands, big national brands, uh, and, and they said, you know, hey, we've got this guy who's running a team. It's a small team. And, uh, you know, he's doing a lot of the things that you're talking about. You should link up with him. Uh, and so I did right, and joined his team. Um, about a year after, a year, year and a half after that, he decided that he was going to leave that big national chain uh, and start his own brokerage. Uh, and I was one, I was the first one to go to the big national chain and say, hey, sayonara, I'm following that guy. Uh, and so we started a, a, what was at the time, a boutique brokerage here in Northern Virginia. Uh, it was about 15 or so agents in his basement at the time. Uh, and we grew it over, over a decade to, almost a decade to over 1,200 agents. Um so I I did make one change in brokerage over the over the years prior to to now, but it was all under the same guy. And uh, you know, for me, it was I think the last several years it was more about just loyalty. You know, like that's that's why I was still there. Um, I think there was a time where there was a lot of innovation he was doing, and you know, he was doing some pretty pretty amazing, pretty radical things in the industry at the time. Um, I think in the last few years there have been some other companies that that have eclipsed. Uh, eclipsed him and you know some of the, the uh, some of the cool stuff that's happening just in the industry right um, and one of them is, is certainly real uh, and you know so I, I started kind of wondering if if the place that I was at was still the best place for me to honor my promise to the agents on my team that I can you know help them change the financial bloodline of their family right I wanted to make sure that we were in the best place possible to do that uh, and so I started looking and I looked at a bunch of different companies uh, and you know, quickly honed in on on real seemed to have seemed to have a lot going on, right? Uh, a lot of stuff that I was I was looking for and felt like I wasn't getting where I was at before, namely, like training, right? You know, being surrounded by you know some some truly big fish in the industry, um, people that were doing 10, 20, 50 times what we were doing, right? Uh, and so um, you know, those were all some of the reasons why I I, I felt like we had to make that move um, because. The industry is changing rapidly, and, and if we're staying stagnant, like we're going to get left behind. Uh, and so we needed to partner with the right people who had the future in mind, um, uh, you know, more so than just kind of living in in the the momentum that we had years ago. You know, you uh, you said something very interesting. You said I, I was worried about. I, I want to help my agents. Like I'm worried about my agents creating. I, I don't know your exact words, but it sounds like lifetime wealth, like a legacy. Yes. And I know that that resonates really well with Sharon and the vision that he sees for his future and why he joined Real as the president. We've had conversations about that. And when you think about your value proposition as a team leader, how are you relaying the message that it's not about the commission you get today. It's about what you do with that commission for tomorrow that really matters because real estate tends to be GCI and it's kind of that big ego dick swinging contest in the locker room. Totally. And so how do you convey to your agents who it's easy to get caught up? Like even if you go to like these big events where everybody's like, how much do you say? I remember when I would go to these events, the first question people would say is, <laughs> Yo, Vic, how much GCI did you make this month? And I'm like, hey, it was nice to see you too. Yeah. <laughs> None of your business, but we closed 10 deals this month. Like, leave me the fuck alone. I'm not going to talk to you about this stuff. Right. How do you convey the message in an industry that is so consumed with what you drive, what you wear, right? How much GCI you make that it's not about the GCI. It's about what you can do long term, because that is a huge pillar for a value proposition for a team leader or a broker to give to their agent, which I don't think, I, I don't know, Cody, what, maybe three to five, 10 percent of people that we've talked to that are team leaders think about? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I, I just tend to talk openly about it. I, I say, you know, look, I, I don't know if if maybe coming from a, a different industry, right? I mean, that's not sales related. You know, I, I just, maybe I look at things very differently, right? Um, but to me, I've, I've, I've been in, you know, some of those same seminars and, you know, some of the same coaching organizations and had some of those same, you know, behind closed doors conversations with folks. And, you know, yeah, they, they, you know, their, their GCI was a million dollars, but they only actually kept 75,000. Right. And it's like, man, like that's, that's not a sexy number at all. Right. And, and, 
Um, no, no offense to anybody who's doing that, right? I mean, it's there's there's room to improve, right? But for me, it's it, we we talk a lot about and and it, you know again kudos to you know the, the brokerage we were at before. One of their core values was you don't have to wear a suit to be taken seriously. Uh, and you know I, you know I mean as I sit here I'm in t-shirt and jeans like this is this is how I do business like you know I, I don't dress down for your podcast like this is just who I am. Um, <laughs> and, and it's you know I, I think it's important to just be authentic who you are right. I mean that's that's number one like don't don't put on some sort of show. Um, I think your tribe, whoever your tribe is, is going to be more attracted to to you for just being authentic. Um, but then we, we talk too about, you know, who cares how much you make? It's it's not about how much you make, it's about how much you keep. Um, because at the end of the day, that like if you if you make a million dollars but it costs you nine hundred and fifty thousand to do it, um, yo, just just go work the nine to five and and make, you know, fifty thousand instead of putting in eighty hours a week to do it. Um and so we, we, it's just a regular part of the conversation. And, you know, that was, again, when, when we made the decision to come to real, it's, you know, I don't want the podcast to be all like, you know, a, a real recruiting thing, but um, it was, you know, very much with that in mind that, you know, we, you can, you can do the same amount of work. You can change your business not at all. And you're going to make more money along the way because they just have more opportunities there to do it. Um, and, and again, without having to put in any extra work, you're not doing anything differently. Uh, and so for me, that was that was important. Um, if we were going to make this change, that it wasn't just beneficial for me, but how did this make sense for the line level agent? I, I guess what I'm trying to get to a little bit more than you know, 100 percent of the agents on this podcast are with real brokers right now. Uh, <laughs> so so it's it's it, it's it's all gravy. But I guess to me, it's more of the Alex mindset of maybe maybe it's because you know you grew up in your your previous career was a law enforcement agent right. and at some point maybe like that kind of gets into your head like hey i can't be out there in the in the field forever i need a backup plan like how do you, how does how do you say that to the agents like how do you enforce that into your as cody would say into your ethos well look i mean i i'm, I'm pretty open about the fact that you know i look i the, growing up my family wasn't in business um, I knew nothing about business, right? I mean, the only thing I've learned about business has been through trial and error and through mentors that I've had along the way. Um, so I've made a boatload of mistakes, uh, and I'm very open about that with my team, you know, but, um, you know, I, I did. I made I made my first million dollars in this industry in 35 months. I pissed away all of it. It's gone, right? Like, I have nothing to show for that first million because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, you know, there were, there were times where, again, I, I think anybody – or as I would say most people, right, in, in growing teams, they do get to that point where that top line number looks super sexy, but they don't want folks to know what their actual take home is. And that's not a fun place to be, you know? Um, and so I think just being open and transparent about that with our agents that, look, there's, you can, you can generate tremendous top line numbers in this business, but if you're not using that to create wealth, uh, you know, um, whether you decide to get out of bed that day or not, right. Um, look, that's a personal decision you can make, but it seems like a foolish one, right? Because you don't, at some point, we we want to, I don't know, go go do something that doesn't require us buying and selling houses. Uh, and so why don't you start setting yourself up little by little by little to do that? Uh, because it's, it's totally attainable. Um, I think it becomes real uh, for folks too when you just help them work it backwards and say, look, you don't need to go out and buy a portfolio of 75 doors today, right? But if you take you know, 10% of your commission check, right? This time and the next check and the next check. Like, look, this is how you get to a portfolio of 75 doors or whatever that number that's going to be, or whatever that investment looks like. Um, you, you you make that a an actionable item today rather than just some big picture dream, right? I love the uh, the idea of like working backwards and, and, you know, something that we talk to all of our agents about, we talk to all of our team members about, uh, you know, like especially our sales team, like working backwards of like how much money you want to make this year, and then what are the daily persistent, consistent actions you need to take to get there. You're a sales guy, and uh, you know through and through, like you do production, you do your own production, and uh, right. like you had mentioned, like you like you mentioned uh, off air that like your your big focus is to kind of help uh, your team get to where they want to go. I'm curious to know, kind of like from a sales perspective in an industry that seems to hate scripts, in an industry that seems to hate 
wanting to actually dig deeper uh like not i'm not saying everyone but like there's there there seems to be this like thing that's happening in the real estate space where it's like there's one line of people who have this ideology that the script isn't about you it's about the client to get your you know, all of the insight out of your head and on a on a paper or into the minds of other people to serve them at a high level you, you've coached other agents as well so you've seen this firsthand what can an agent in 2023 do in order to increase their production from a sales perspective? So I, I think, especially, you know, you're talking about scripting. Um, and, and I do believe, I, I think, I think it was Sharon, right? Was the first one that I, I think it's one of those things that like, I kind of had thought of in my head, but I haven't put verbiage to before, right? That like the script isn't for the agent, the script is for the client, right? Um, and I, I had never like put that verbiage together, but once I, once I heard that, I was like, shit, he's so right. Like that's, that's on point. Um, I, I think the, the thing that I, I would encourage folks to do is recognize that objections, right? Like you're going to get objections in sales. It doesn't matter what business you're in. Um, but the thing is, is that there's a finite number of them. So just start tracking. What are the objections you get? And then, you know, again, mastermind with, with a mentor or other agents or whatever, like, um, and that was, this was the, the uh, in-person mastermind that we did a few weeks ago was, you know, let's flush out all the objections we're hearing. And then let's just group think what are the best ways to handle those objections to get our clients from from where they are to where they want to be, uh, and you know just once you learn what the best ones are, then then this is this is a no brainer. It becomes very easy because you hear the exact same ones over and over and over. And so the, the job then simply becomes be prepared for when you hear objection six, right? You've got the handler for objection six, um, and in in a way that serves the client and, and gets them closer to ultimately what their goal is, you know. Where where do you think this resistance to scripting lies? Is this an industry <laughs> thing? It, like, yeah, you know, I'm really trying to be, uh I'm really trying to dig in lately and me and Vic have had so many conversations around this. And I've been having a lot of conversations with the Sharon about this. I'm like coming from the outside of the industry, I'm like, I, I come from a sales background and mm -hmm scripting and overcoming objections and like i spent 10 years in sales like that was like my thing so like it just like i have a hard time understanding from the outside looking in like why you wouldn't do that like where like fundamentally do you think there needs to be a shift in the in the language that coaches are using where do you think the resistant the resistance lies in the agent's ability to actually figure out how to overcome objections how to use a script where, like, where is the resistance happening and how can we collectively as a, as a, as a body of people kind of shift the perspective, do you think? Well, look, I, I think I, what I would say is, you know, for the folks that don't like to use scripts, I would challenge them. I would say, are you are, like, you're sitting here and telling me that you don't use scripts in your own life? Bullshit. Sorry, you do. Because I mean, for those of us with kids, right? I mean, uh, how many times has, yeah, has, has there ever been a time, right? Where your child was, was doing or not doing something they weren't supposed to. And you said, Hey, you need to, you know, you need to hand me that, that thing you're not supposed to have one, two, three, right. I mean, you start, you start the countdown, right. That's a script, right. Because it, it ultimately gets the behavior that you're, you're, you're looking for. Right. Um, when I was a cop, I had my script, Hey, deputy Bracky Loudon County Sheriff's office. The reason I stopped you is because of X. Is there any legally justifiable reason for it? Like these are all scripts, right. Um, they're not always meant for like, sales per se, but I mean, it kind of is, you know, when I had somebody stopped and I knew that they were drunk as a skunk. Um, and I said, Hey, what, you know, why don't you step out of the car? And they said, no, well, no, you know, whatever. And I said, well, look, uh, you know, I can't treat you any differently than I would anybody else. Right. I mean, that just wouldn't be fair. So why don't you, you know, like I, I, you know, I would get them to get out of the car and, and do what I needed them to do, um, simply by having objection handlers. Right. And that's what we would call it in, in business. Um, but that's that's all it is, and so I, I think this notion that that folks don't want to learn scripts, um, I, I think it's um, the jaded part of me would say that it's it's a laziness thing, right? They they don't want to have to learn something new, um, not because they're they are somehow opposed to scripts because everybody uses them, like they're they're lying if they said they don't. Um, they just don't want to have to learn these new ones. You know, I, I I'm I'm going to interject my thoughts on it, Cody, is that people don't get into real estate, you know, we, on our, on our last interview with, uh, 
that we had, um, people don't get into real estate with a plan. They get into real estate by accident. It's the it's the the dental assistant that's tired of being a dental assistant and looking in the jaws. It's the mom that's no longer wanting to be at home anymore and she doesn't want to go into the corporate world because she wants the flexibility and the freedom that real estate offers. And when you look around and you're like, wow, this is a position that I can make six figures in, it seems relatively easy because nobody actually talks about the difficultness of real estate. I don't think that, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear what your guys' thoughts are. I don't think that people understand that this is actually a sales position, even though it says real estate salesperson on your your license. And I feel like it's not talked about a lot either because brokerages need volume to stay around. And they don't realize that if you have 50 agents that do really well and they all cap, you make more money than 200 agents that suck. And so it's a it's an MLS thing where they all get money. Like I, I pay the, I'm, I'm not actively selling real estate anymore, but I still pay the MLS a thousand bucks or whatever it is a year, right? So they want me to stay around. The brokerages want you to stay around. Everybody wants that warm body in the office because it gives you that feeling of warmth. But I don't believe that they're actually getting into the position to learn to be salespeople. They got into the position because it sounded sexy. Uh, I, I thoughts around that. And, and, and I think that if we change the mindset around what it takes to be successful in real estate, it's not just showing up. It's you got to treat this like a fight. You know, it, if you spent $250,000, right, Cody, if you spent $250,000, Alex, on an office and you had to buy your furniture and you had to buy the TVs and you had to do a build out and it took six months to do the build out and you had to pick the floors and you had to learn about this new program to, to sell your widgets, wouldn't you put more effort into it than if you spent $2,700, if you even spend that much money? I think a thousand percent. I mean, you know, consider consider the fact that um, I think the actual stats, 48% or 52, call, call it 50, right? 50% of all real estate agents sold two houses or less last year, right? So this isn't their profession. Their profession is something else. This is just the side hustle, right? It's it's they'll they'll take the low hanging fruit when they can get it, right? Um, but there's not the 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 grind or the hustle, or treating this as a profession, right? That maybe they have in their in their day job, and so I think that's part of it is that there's only a very select few of us that truly treat this as a profession and want to hone the craft that we're in, uh, and and really want to want to work at it and do the best that we possibly can. Uh, I, I think that's a, that's in my opinion, a huge piece of it. When you're speaking with your team, um, I'm really curious because you don't like you had mentioned like you don't have uh, like you have you have a small team, but like you do good production numbers. I'm curious to know, as a team leader who is very focused around uh, sales and very focused around helping people and making a large impact, like you know, like to to have the to have the ethos to life that it's like I want to help, you know the financial bloodline of my family. That's a, that's no small task. Like everyone that comes into your ecosystem, like I'm guessing has to share a very similar type of value. Like what does your process look like in order to recruit somebody with a similar type of values? And what do like, what are some of the values that you've been able to instill into your real estate agents that have been maybe the catalyst for what they're producing in their own lives for their own families? So I, I think just, being hungry, man, being hungry to improve, you know, whether that's personally, whether it's professionally, um, that's sort of an expectation on our team is that you need to be hungry and you need to be uh, working to improve yourself in, in kind of all aspects, right? I tell folks candidly, like I can train skills, I can train strategy, I can train um, scripts and objections, right? But I can't train desire. You either have that or you don't. Um, and I can't want this for you, right? I mean, this is a real estate is a phenomenal place to be able to create a business that does change the financial bloodline of your family. I'm, I'm living proof of it, right? But you got to want it. Like you got to work for it. I mean, you're going to have to work your face off. You know, it, it's just because just because it's real estate doesn't mean that it's a get rich quick scheme. Uh, and so, I mean, that's that's part of what I'm looking for is is I don't I don't need somebody who's crazy polished. Um, I don't, you know, I, 
again, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm a bald headed bearded, you know, former cop, like, you know, I, I dressed in t-shirt and jeans. Like I'm polished is not the word people would use to describe me. Um, but I am willing to work my face off. Uh, and, and I will work harder than anybody else. You know, no one will outwork me. Uh, and so I think for me, that's what I'm looking for is, um, you, you don't have to be, um, the smoothest, you know, you don't have to, you, you do have to come to the table ready to work your face off. Uh, and I'm, I'm a little bit different in that I, I will sometimes take agents that have other jobs, right? They're wanting to make that transition, but I'm upfront with them that, you know, look, my expectations of you are no different than what they are for somebody who only works real estate, right? You just now have two full-time jobs. Uh, and so you're just going to think you're going to be short on sleep or whatever it is, but um, that's just simply what's required to, to break through. And, and so again, it kind of just gets back to that. Are you willing to hustle? Are you willing to work your face off? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to find that success and, and, you know, alter the, the trajectory of your family? You know, um, this kind of ties back to what you said in the green room earlier. You're, you're talking in the green room about, um, oh shit, I just forgot my question. Dude, <laughs> Congratulations, Vikram. I have a, I have a question, so I'll take over since you since you're mind blank. So I, I, I would I would like to point out that I I've left Vikram speechless. speechless so yeah. oh you know, oh I, 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 I that's that's a rare thing, and I'm not going to give you uh I'm going to give you credit for it. So so you you did talk about in the green room how um the the you know we're talking you're, you're talking about culture and you're talking about you've had some hardships in the past with your business where. You know, you know, things have kind of, you said, collapsed and you f you think you figured it out now. The ethos that you have in your culture is very similar to the one that I have, Cody has, Sharon has, right? It, it's, you got to work your your face off. Um, and I, I've never seen a successful person in any industry not do that. When you hire people, is there something that you look for to see if they have that internal drive? Is there... Is there something that you can see, like, is there a, you know, you could do the disc profile, you could do this profile, the this one, and you could do all the profiling in the world, but is there something that when you are interviewing, or is there a process that you guys have that's like a little nugget that a team leader that's hiring, because I've met so many team leaders that hire the wrong person, and it's not bad that they hire the wrong person, it's just they don't know how to fire that person. Yeah. And that person drags them through the mud. So is there something that you have figured out, Alex, and your in your ups and downs and businesses collapsing over the years? Um in short, no. Okay. Cool. <laughs> no, I mean cool. I mean, look, I, I think I, I think the the thing that I, I look for is like what have they achieved? Right. I mean, I, I look back to again, I, I didn't come from a sales background. But it would have been very easy for me to point to, you know, hey, here were the achievements I had. This is where, you know, very obviously I was kicking ass as compared to my colleagues, right? Um, we've had folks on our team that have, you know, they they were on, you know, sort of a wrong path earlier in life. And then they had they were celebrating, say, you know, three years of sobriety, right? Like to me, that's again, it's that's that's a big deal, right? Like that's sometimes one of the hardest struggles you can go through in life is, is getting clean and sober. And so to me, again, that shows that the person has some fire in their belly, like they're willing to work for something that's not easy. Uh, and so that's what I'm looking for is what is the track record of, of success that you've had, even if not in sales, just in life, right? Like, do you have big goals for yourself? Are you one that is going to come in and like push the envelope of what you're capable of um, trying to better yourself? Uh, whether again, personally or professionally, I think that's to me is the biggest telltale sign of whether you're going to succeed here uh, mm -hmm. is just that willingness to grind. Yeah. I like, I like that you, um, I like you look a little bit deeper. That is a, that is a superpower. That is a, uh, that is a nugget where you look into their personal life and you're like, oh shit, three years of sobriety or you're uh, you did 75 hard or you, you know, right. you're overweight and now you've lost 30 pounds and you're on your path to 60 pounds. It, it does show something in that person that most people don't have. Exactly. Pretty cool. Alex, man, uh, it was amazing to sit down with you today to kind of like just learn a little bit more about your story, but also just to kind of like get so much value out of like what real estate is. Because this is really what we're trying to accomplish is like, you know, in an industry that the vast majority fail, I think there is 
an opportunity that we have. And the part of the reason me and Vikram started this podcast was you can learn from other people from their wins, their losses, their lessons, and their stories. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time to just share so vulnerably about the ups and the downs that you've had in your business and in your life. If someone you want to reach out to you, maybe it's an agent to agent referral, maybe it's, you know, somebody in the Virginia area wants to consider joining a really great opportunity in a team, or maybe it's just somebody like uh, wants to pick your brain on something real estate related. Where's the best place we can drive them to reach out to you to have a conversation? Yeah, so you can find me on social at Alex Brackey. The last name is B as in Bravo, R-A-C-K-E. Uh, at Alex Brackey, uh, you can hit me on email, Alex at Valor Group, R-E. Uh, that's V as in Victor, A-L-O-R, Group, R-E as in real estate.com. Um, or you can hit us uh, on, on our website, Valor Group, R-E.com. Alex, bottom of the Vikram and I's heart, I want to say thank you. And I want to say thank you for tuning into another episode of the R-E Agent Podcast. If you're listening back on iTunes, Spotify, or if you're listening back on uh, YouTube, leave us a review on iTunes. Uh, it means the world. We're really trying to make a massive difference in the real estate community, helping get wins, losses, lessons, stories out in front of people. And the best way we can help more real estate agents that we can get in front of more real estate agents to give them the information that they can thrive in their space, in their local market, is if you leave us a review. Uh, iTunes likes that for some reason. Uh, so Ruby in the world to me wanted to say thank you for tuning in to another episode of the RE Agent Podcast. We'll see you soon.